ay panahon nga ako mag-auga sa akong pagsimba kanimo o Diyos ko kung akong inunduman ang mga nabuhat mo dili ko makapugo pagkai kanimo Psalm 23, that the good shepherd will lead us beside the still waters and cause us to lie down in luscious green pastures. But that is not this place. <clears throat> this place is wilderness. It's the land between lands. It's a harsh climate. Dangers are lurking everywhere. This is barren land, sort of like the land from which God had brought dew and life out of creation when he spoke the world into existence or form and shape. I guess you could say that this is the land of Isaiah's vision where the grass and flowers grow and the grass and flowers fade. They're here today and gone tomorrow. This is the land where the high priest placed his hand upon the scapegoat as he sent him out to die in the wilderness on the Day of Atonement. This is the land of John the Baptist subsisting or, or sustaining himself on locusts and wild honey and preaching repentance. This is the land where we find Jesus walking from the Jordan where he was baptized, headed to Jerusalem where he would be crucified. The wilderness that Jesus was driven into today, oh, I, I know the scripture that you heard and read said that Jesus was led. The word's a little more harsh than that. 
some Bible commentaries want to soften that a little bit. It actually says that Jesus was driven. The Spirit of God drove him. Almost as an unwilling partner. Drove him into the wilderness. And this is, in fact, our text. It's not a gentle leading of Jesus. Uh, it's, it's almost as if he's thrown out into the wilderness. If we're to take the gospel language literally. It was definitely not somewhere where most people would want to go spend a week's vacation. Now there are some people that enjoy that kind of thing. But anybody here? Oh, didn't think so. It's not a place where you want to spend a bunch of time. But Jesus went there. And according to our text, spent 40 days, long days, fasting, praying, and at the end to be tempted by Satan. The text is right with Old Testament echoes. If you were a first century Jew, just the thought of Jesus being tempted brings up memories of Another temptation. Anybody know? Yeah, in the garden. In the garden. We have some scholars in the church. <laughs> Where the first Adam and Eve, though circumstances were different, they had everything that they needed and nothing that they wanted. <coughs> it was a beautiful garden full of rich fruit. It was a place of wonder and beauty and where they walked with God where the first Adam faced the first temptation. Now we see the second Adam, Paul says, facing the same temptation, but the conditions are entirely different. After 40 days, Bible says Jesus was famished. Amen. He was hungry. For St. Matthew, the act of fasting in the wilderness is heavy in history, ripe with meaning. Amen. Because the wilderness is a place of preparation. We see all throughout the Old Testament. A place for intercession. A place where many went to wait on God. Elijah. David. Saul. A place to rest from your labors. After crossing the waters of the Red Sea, God led Moses and the people into the wilderness and to the mountain where Moses fasted for how many days? You got it. 40 days and 40 nights prior to receiving the tablets of the law. After this profound experiences of Passover and the miraculous bread coming down from heaven, the wilderness is where Israelites, the, the people of God, grumbled about their food and provoked God's patience and fell into idolatry. This happened in the wilderness. After the Israelites sinned, Moses went up into the mountain again, fasted for 40 more days and 40 nights to intercede between God and his people, after which God relented of his anger. Later, King David fled into the wilderness to fast and to wait on God for deliverance after his lapse of idolatry and while his own son hunted him down in open rebellion. Finally, Elijah, you will recall, fled for his life. After the great victory of battle at Mount Carmel, he was told, by Jezebel that he she was coming after him and she was going to make his life like those of the prophets of Baal. This is where he fell to the ground in the refusal of his calling. God didn't call him out in the wilderness and yet there he's confronted. He's sustained by God and renewed before he also undertook a 40-day fast on his road to meet God. Amen. So it, this text is right with echoes of the Old Testament. 
The wilderness is where the identity of God's people <coughs> is revealed. Did you hear that? And it is for this reason that God chooses the wilderness as the setting for Jesus' battle to overcome evil, the devil. So I guess in a way, Jesus becomes an icon for all God's people, taking on his shoulders, their history, and their identity. And Jesus goes to the wilderness because his people has history there. However, there's a big difference between their history and his history. For the people of Israel had failed in their wilderness test, even where even Moses and David and Elijah faltered in their own calling through disobedience, infidelity, and ex exhaustion. Jesus proves his obedience. He maintains his faithfulness and he sustains his strength. Jesus is proven to be mightier than King David, more faithful than Elijah, and greater than the lawgiver Moses. This is powerful. Je Jesus' victory over the devil was a victory to fulfill Israel's calling through his perfect faithfulness to the word of God. God's people are no strangers to the wilderness. They have fought both God and enemy in the wilderness for many, many years. But for Christ, the fight here is even more profound because these temptations are not only the temptations of a turbulent and conflicting people in the ancient Near East. They are rather the temptations of all of us. Do you see them? Amen. Do you feel them? Do you encounter them on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. Just go back to the beginning of Genesis. Deceiver has nothing new. Yes. We see them knotted together in the first temptations in Eden. The devil offers food. <coughs> he offers spectacle. He offers power. The gospel writer John would later name these things the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Those are the temptations facing all of us. And for centuries, the church names these temptations the arch enemies of the soul, the flesh, the world, and the devil. And you face them every day day of your life. Regardless of the names, the fight of Jesus shows him to be the faithful son of the Father. I, I like in Mark's gospel and his rendering because as soon as Jesus goes to be baptized by John, the heavens open, the Spirit of God lands upon Jesus, and the voice of the Father says, This is my Son, and whom I am well pleased. I love him. This is the son that I love. This is my son. Amen. What does the devil say? If you are the son of God. Yes. Don't you think God knew that Jesus needed to know to be reminded? Yes. Yet you are my son. You are his daughter and his son. Remember that next time the enemy comes Amen. to you. Live it. You see, what message can we take away from this text today? What meat can we bite into and chew on? Uh, what nourishment can we take for our own wilderness journey? What are some life lessons that can Teach us something today. Well, in his victory, I believe that Jesus shows that endurance of temptation and hardship is a necessary part of 
carrying out our calling as Christians. Let me say that again, because I think that some of us thought that being a Christian uh, was going to be easy and smooth and fun all the time. Jesus shows us that endurance of temptations and hardship is a necessary part of carrying out our calling to come and follow Jesus. The lid of Jesus is a gift to us because it teaches us faithfulness and obedience to God's word. I mean, could he easily turn stones into bread? We're not created to live by bread alone, but every what? Word that comes out of the mouth of God. The letter of Jesus is a gift to us because it teaches us to trust, to be faithful, obedient, consistent, reliance on the word of God in every aspect of our lives and perfect surrender to the plan of God over our life. That you think that would be easy to do, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Because you have a real enemy. He's, James says that he's like a roaring lion. Yes. You know why it does? Huh? It paralyzes. Yes, it scares you. You freeze for a second. Now the lion's got the advantage. If I was in the wilderness somewhere and a lion jumped out at me, I, I, he would choke to death on dust trying to catch me. <laughs> it wouldn't take him for long, but he could find <laughs> The gift of Easter is a gift and not a reward. Think about this just for a second. Easter will come not because we conducted a thoughtful and thorough and perfect and we've uh, lent. Uh, and that, so when we get to Easter, we sort of earn the blessing of that. Mm -hmm. You see, the good news is because even, because even three days into the fast, we might be feeling... Uh, I resolve falter a little. As we observe Lent, we going to spend more time in the scripture, right? We're, we're, we're going to dedicate a few more minutes a day into focusing on our relationship with God. Isn't that your plan? Uh, I mean, we're, we're going to give a little bit more. We're going to eat a little bit less. We're going to do all these things that we said we were going to do at the beginning of the year, but failed to do. And so Lent sort of becomes a little second chance to catch up on those New Year's resolutions. I think we've got it wrong. Is, is that what Lent is really all about? The, the, the best Lent to me has already been performed with total obedience and self-giving by the only one who has never needed Lent at all. His Lent is an example and an invitation. His Lent demands our response. You see, the primary purpose of Lent is meant to be a time of uh, what? Repentance. Th that's not a, a feeling of shame, but of an awareness that sin separates us from God and what Christ endured to save us from sin, death, and the devil. Shame has its place, I'm sure, but feeling shame over sin is not the same thing as repentance from sin. Feeling sorry that you've done something wrong is not the same as turning from it and going in a different direction and not doing that again. Hallelujah. Did you hear that out there? Yes. I'm glad I wrote it down so I can read it for myself. <laughs> you see, 
shame has its place, but feeling shame over sin is not the same thing as repentance from sin because our tempter can even take our obedience to God and turn that into a source of pride. Well, look how good Amen. I've done. Repentant sinners seek cleansing from sin, but also freedom from shame. Did you hear that? Yes. True repentance leads to a 180 degree change of direction and requires true brokenness. But repentance starts with a grateful uh, or a regretful acknowledgement of sin with a commitment to change. David said in Psalm 51, Lord, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. I would go to church more often and put more in the altar plate and go and visit my neighbor to show. Look, no, David said, you don't delight in sacrifice or I'd bring it. You don't even take any pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. David realized he had sinned. My sin is ever before you, and you and you only have I sinned, O oh Lord. Wash me with hyssop. Cleanse me, David said, and I'll be whiter than snow. Return to me the joy of my salvation. That's restoration. Amen. <coughs> then David said, Lord, if I could do anything to make this right for you, I, I would do it. But all I could do is just be broken and say, Lord, have mercy on me according to your grace and mercy, your unfailing love. Blot out my transgressions. You talking about having a good wit? There it is. Many uh, Christians conflate Lent with, as I said earlier, New Year's resolutions, and that can be dangerous. Lent is an opportunity to contemplate what our Lord really did for us on the cross. And I'm going to do my best to lead us and to that understanding in the weeks before Easter as all we're going to do is talk about Jesus and his walk and journey to the cross. So I want to ask that we all take a moment to truly repent of our sins, make fresh commitments to follow God's word, to seek the means of grace each and every day, and to commit to being a true disciple. Said about being a follower of him, we're asked to deny ourselves. I think Jesus said that. To take up our cross. Amen. Now that's not some burden that you have to live with or sickness. To take up the cross of Christ means that you're taking up to do the will of God. Does that make sense? Whatever that is required. Jesus said, I've come not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Even he told us to pray, not my will, but thy will be done. Deny yourself. That's a good way to start a lit. Take up your cross, and I like Luke's version, and follow me daily. Jesus went into that wilderness. He faced it all by himself. I know the song that we sang this morning says that we have to go into that wilderness, that lonesome valley, and we have to walk it all by ourselves. No one else can walk it with us, but I want to tell you, God will walk it with you. I mean, I understand the, 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 the hymnology of the song. In other words, uh, if I was walking through the wilderness and needed comfort, I want Bill McDermott to go with me. 
Because what better source of encouragement in the wilderness, right? But Bill can't walk in the wilderness with me, but God can walk with you. And God does walk with you. Amen. And each and every time the enemy comes and shows you the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and what you think you can gain from this world in faithfulness and obedience Jesus has gone before us and showed us how to live out that wilderness experience in faithfulness and obedience to the word of God Let us pray. Okay, hi. Happy Sunday. And we're in. Tapos na po kami. Bye. God bless. Happy Sunday. Happy blessed Sunday. Bye-bye. Ikaw ang liwanag sa matilim na daan Ikaw ang siyang tandaw sa aking kinabukasan Ikaw ang bumabay sa aming pag-aaral Kahit hirap sa buhay, ikaw ay nakaalala Jesus Christ, love and care ministry Kahit di ka nakikita, I always know your love for me Handang tumulong sa mga nang nangilangan Sa iyong gabay, kami ay may natutunan Napakabuti ng inyong mga puso Sa mga tulong nyo, meron yung balik sa dulo Laki ng aming pasasalamat Laging dasalang malayo sa kahirapan Jesus Christ, love and your ministry Napakabuti ng iyong puso sa pagtulong di na huli Sana hindi magbago ang iyong pagkatao Tuloy-tuloy mo lang dahil lahat kami saludo Jesus Christ, love and your ministry Napakabuti ng iyong puso sa pagtulong di na huli Sana hindi Magbago ang iyong pagkatao Tuloy-tuloy mo lang dahil lahat kami saludo Sa bawat pag-ising mo pagtulog Sa katauhan namin ikaw ang humubog Mga pangaral at salita mo sa amin ay tumatap Tinurin mo kami sa mundo na isang anak Di mo binabayaan sa oras ng kahirapan Binusubin may kagutuman na nararanasan Ikaw ang tanging ina namin Kanuman Diyos na ang bahalang magbalik sa iyong kabaitan Mga pangaral mo ang nagsilbi sa aming aral Nagbigay lapis at papel bumubuhit na parang anghel Nagpatayo ng simbahan Kung saan pwede naming masilungan Maging takuhan Ito yung binabalot ng kadiliman Salita ng Panginoon to nila nila Jesus Christ, love and your ministry Napakabuti ng iyong puso Sa pagtulong di na huli Sana hindi magbago ang iyong pagkatao Tuloy-tuloy mo lang dahil lahat kami saludo Jesus Christ, love and your ministry Napakabuti ng iyong puso Sa pagtulong di na huli Sana hindi magbago ang iyong pagkatao Tuloy-tuloy mo lang dahil lahat kami sa luto Christ, love and your ministry Napakabuti ng iyong puso sa pagtulong di na huli Sana hindi magbago ang iyong pagkatao Tuloy-tuloy mo lang dahil lahat kami sa luto Jesus, Christ, love and your ministry Napakabuti ng iyong puso sa pagtulong di na huli Sana hindi magbago ang iyong pagkatao